column. All right. Give me a second here. All right. Um, gonna drink some more water because my throat is really dry. Um, oof. Sorry. All right. So this is gonna be pretty fun. All right. Economics. Here we go. Um, so we'll start with a brief overview of the the previous pod, economic podcast, and then we will do a general overview of of um, economics, examining some of the changes that have shaped our world and some of the commentary concerning these changes. Um, wow. Okay, I forgot to go back and change that. That is absolutely not what we are going to be doing. Uh, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be looking at um, the looking at uh, economic history and and commentators on economic history to see where you know how we got to this present state right now um and and how how the business of economics ought to be carried out um so that means we're going you know we will be looking at adam smith obviously but that means also going back and looking at like mercantilism and um and all of this other stuff because we tend to think that like a lot of the financial institutions that we have right now or, you know, we're, are new, are very new with the coming of Adam Smith, but not necessarily true. Sorry, excuse me. Um, okay, but I will be recapping the, the, the last episode. So <laughs> sorry for that slip up, but we will, I will be doing that. So if you remember the, the episode last time, um, or if you haven't seen it, we examined the division between negative and positive economics and critiqued each of each for its overreach into other academic disciplines, um, something that has led to a lot of confusion over what economics is. Now, if you remember, negative economics needs philosophy to justify its claims, since it is not only the, since it is not only that its modeling for human behavior is faulty and needs a few tweaks, which it does because it is, but rather that what negative economics defines as rational self-interest is a philosophical claim touching the very root of human behavior and not an economic claim. Um, it's not something that can be, that, that can be quantified. Um, it's something that we have to approach using reason. As we saw last time, there has been enormous debate over the centuries as to what principle human behavior should revolve around. Uh, you have Aristotle who says happiness, you have uh, Kant who says duty, and now you have um, you know, modern economics saying, uh, material prosperity, like it's just all over the map. So just to stipulate that as, as you know, trivially true is is just pretty ridiculous. Um, so, but he, okay, but let's say that somehow modern economics is correct. Like they they hey, we all behave like you know materialistic animals. Well, even if they struck that gold by chance, they would still need a philosophical backing uh, for arguing that. Uh, that this actual human behavior is correct human behavior. Um, otherwise, it would just be an observational science like psychology. Like this is what happens. This is what happens. Is you know. Um, so, but if it wants to tries to say this ought to happen, or you know that ought to happen, then then it's treading on philosophy's toes there a little bit or a lot. Uh, so this confusion also extends into positive economics as well. Now, positive economics takes the extremely tenuous grounds of negative economics and not only are, agrees with negative economics' faulty view of human behavior, but also argues that this extremely faulty view of human behavior ought to be the gold standard. Um, like, you, you gotta act in your rational self-interest. Uh, pedal to the metal. Once again, positive economics is encroaching upon ethics turf and needs philosophical arguments to support its case since economics only focuses on what is strictly quantifiable. And you can't quantify things like virtue, things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, like happiness or, I mean, you can kind of quantify happiness, but um, not in the, it it's not gonna give you something in, in the Catholic sense of what happiness means. And yeah, so just to, just to reduce all human behavior to what is quantifiable is, like is the same as physics reducing metaphysics to all that is all that is quantifiable 
um, and saying, oh, nothing can, nothing can exist outside of the quantifiable. Well, you're just begging the question against, against people who say that, it had it, that they do exist and they can. Um, you're not actually providing an argument uh, against it because you actually need to make a philosophical argument, not a physics argument, or a philosophical argument, not an economics argument, that what you're doing is uh, true and desirable. Um, so I don't mean to be a downer. So we've, we've, criti we've critiqued modern economics. Um, where do we go from here? I don't want to just like shoot it down and say, hey, it's, uh, you know, don't pay any attention to it. Um, is there anything we can offer in its place? Now, I would say yes, uh, but it, it's definitely murky. Uh, because of economics' claims to accurately represent the way in which humans actually behave and how they ought to behave, there's almost no discipline in the humanities which isn't affected by economics. In philosophy, economics begs the question against ethics and reduces human behavior to materialistic, consumerist animals, reduces our behavior to that. In psychology, it holds an outmoded and false view of humans of how humans actually behave. Not that I'm in any way defending the way psychology is carried out today, but I'm just saying economics is encroaching upon psychology, um, which that's a whole separate discussion. Uh, in politics, economic prosperity has become paramount. And since Adam Smith in the 18th century, since cited as the founder of economics, Economics has been a pariah upon other academic disciplines, slowly sucking the lifeblood out of them all unseen and shrouded by its mysterious secret formulae. If you're not a mathematician, it's like you can't, you can't say anything because you, you don't know the math, um, which is kind of absurd. Okay, so be that as it may, the goal for the rest of this podcast is to sketch a working theory of how economics should work from a Catholic point of view and to introduce some authors who may be of use in that regard. Uh, to my knowledge, no one has tried to develop a working economic theory outside, from a fully Catholic perspective outside of G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc with their distributism in the early 20th century. Uh, but, but please feel free to comment if you know of any other works that might be relevant. Um, I'll, I'll, be just, I'll be naming a few here in a second. So I get to read almost all the books I'm about to present to you. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be learning right along with all of you guys. Um, yeah, so by working theory or like whatever working theory we have right now, we're, it's definitely a work in progress. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited to, to be able to journey with you all as we, as we try to figure this out because yeah, I, you know, just, I'm just taking a leap of faith right now. Um, so, but before reading books, what we have to think about what might be a good place to start. Um, well, a good place to start is we, we know from, or at least I argue that economics uh, today is opposed to philosophy, psychology, and politics. So if we can imagine each, if we can examine each of these disciplines and see in what way they are related to uh, um, economics, we can see how economics destroy, or how economics, how economics uh, appropriates their, their material. Um, so for the first one, let's look at, uh, let's look at philosophy. So, um, so economics is actually a Greek word meaning household management, uh, and refers to the proper managing of the household. This definition doesn't specify in advance what the proper managing of the household is, only that there is one. Um, you need a philosophical argument to, to say that, you know, for example, to say that the proper management of the household is maintaining it rather than destroying it. Like, obviously we would say, well, you should maintain it, but we only know that by intuition. It, there's no argument that is being presented for that. You need a philosophical basis to, 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 pro to really prove that. Um, yeah, so the first two books, which have immediate relevance um, now, both of which I haven't read yet, uh, but they probably will be the books we, we start off with, are Aristotle's Economics and his Nicomachean Ethics, um, which explore these questions in more de detail. So Aristotle's Economics coming from the point of view of household management and Nicomachean Ethics, which should hopefully see help us see how, uh, how modern 
uh, economics is, is taking over uh, eth ethics when it shouldn't be. So the second discipline we mentioned that economics is encroaching on is psychology. Now, psychology isn't exactly in good standing either, <laughs> having adopted much of the materialist ideas that economics has. But nonetheless, even from an atheist materialist perspective, there is still friction between it and economics. There are some relevant works here from the psychological point of view, which oppose economics view of the human being, materialistic view of the human being, uh, such as Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which develops a psychological theory termed logotherapy based on Viktor Frankl's observations of human behavior in concentration camps. Viktor Frankl was actually in a concentration camp uh, for some time and he managed to survive. And then his, this Man's Search for Meaning is just a lot of, it's a really good book, a lot of stories from, from that time. Uh, there's also Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, which outlines how humans tick, and Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational, which argues that we are not the rational agents economics claims we are. All right, that takes us to the third discipline mentioned in poli the third discipline mentioned, which is politics. Uh, sorry. Um, now this one is definitely the hardest to see, um, since it depends on. Because, yeah, because our society is so materialistic. Um, and I'm going to be completely honest up front that I have little idea how to properly separate the two. Uh, but there are numerous works that should help make that division easier. So, again, like, I, this is a very working theory. Um, I'm going to, I've got to do some reading. Um, and I don't just want to, like, speak completely off the cuff. Uh, so I want to, I actually want to back up what I'm saying. So, um, hopefully, uh, some of these works will, will help us answer this question, um, but, the, but some of these works include Hilaire Belloc's The Servile State, G.K. Chesterton, What's Wrong with the World, The Outline of Sanity, uh, Utopia of Usurers, and other essays. Then we have Douglas North's, North's The State of Economic History, Carl Polanyi's The Great Transformation, Joseph Schumpeter's Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, Ludwig von Mises' Socialism, and finally Hayek's Road to Serfdom. Uh, some of these books include both an economic and political component, which is, again, very hard to tease apart, um, but I hope that we can delineate the two. So uh, our working theory of what economics ought to be is not close, not really that close to being fully fleshed out, but we have the bones there in place. We know from the first podcast that economics appropriated material from philosophy, psychology, and economics, and we now have a rough sketch of the kind of materials we might need, as well as some considerations which will need to be taken into account. And hopefully these will lead us more or less to the truth. Um, yeah, and that's about all I have in economics. I know it's a bit of a shorter video today. Uh, I know philosophy kind of stole a bunch of the airtime, but um, I think that's about it. So yeah, please uh, remember the announcements that if you want to watch you can watch the full length podcast or you can watch the podcast split into three parts. And um, I'm also going to be sending out a form via Facebook uh, to ask for feedback, which hopefully will work this time because uh, it didn't the first time. Um, all right. I think that's about it. Uh, thank you all for making this far, making it this far, and hope you have a, have a good day. Uh, God bless.